husband, Russell, is an artist. And I am May, and I have an interest in true crime. We decided to merge our two interests together. Enjoy this calming visual while listening to a tragic story. This is Stuart and Crime. It was 1993 when Christopher Simmons, 17 at the time, concocted a plan to murder a woman named Shirley Crook. He brought along two younger friends, Charles Benjamin and John Tesmer, to join in his plan to commit burglary and murder by breaking and entering, tying up a victim, and tossing the victim off a bridge. The three boys met in the middle of the night. However, Tesmer gained some sense and left, but Simmons and Benjamin carried on and broke into Mrs. Crook's home, bound her hands, and covered her eyes. They drove her to a state park and threw her off a bridge. Once this case went to trial, the evidence was overwhelming. Simmons had confessed to the murder, performed a videotaped reenactment at the crime scene, and Tesmer provided testimony against him that showed premeditation. The jury returned a guilty verdict, and Simmons was sentenced to death. The case worked its way up the court system, with the courts continuing to uphold the death sentence. But things took a turn when a 2002 U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Atkins v. Virginia overturned the death penalty for the mentally challenged. Christopher Simmons then filed a new petition for state post-conviction relief that is now widely known as Roper v. Simmons, in which the Missouri Supreme Court concluded that a national consensus has developed against the execution of juvenile offenders. This allowed Simmons' conviction from death to be changed to life imprisonment without parole. This changed the course of death penalty cases for juveniles going forward, as on March 1, 2005, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Eighth Amendment that prohibits cruel and unusual punishment and Fourteenth Amendment that allows equal protection of the laws forbid the execution of offenders who are younger than age 18 when the crime occurred. The vote was 5-4, with Justice Kennedy stating for the majority. When a juvenile offender commits a heinous crime, the state can exact forfeiture of some of the most basic liberties, but the state cannot extinguish his life and his potential to attain a mature understanding of his own humanity. By 2005, 30 states had either abolished the death penalty for all offenders or at least for those under the age of 18. As with its earlier ruling exempting defendants with intellectual disabilities, the court found that a national consensus had formed around excluding those under 18, and that there was little to be gained in terms of deterrence or retribution by executing younger offenders. Some justices pointed to the fact that the U.S. was virtually alone in the world in allowing juvenile offenders to be executed. The emerging science of brain development also contributed to this decision. Debate has continued on whether even the age of 18 is too young to assume full adult accountability for a heinous crime. Some have suggested that 21 would be a more appropriate age, both because of the rights and responsibilities conferred by society at that age and because new brain science shows that critical areas of the brain relating to judgment, thrill-seeking, and consequential thinking do not mature until the mid-20s. As a result of the Roper decision, 72 individuals on death row were resentenced. But prior to the ruling, 22 inmates were executed in the modern death penalty era for crimes committed before they reached 18. One of those 22 inmates was Joseph Cannon. In 1977, at the age of 17, he ran away from his Houston home but when making his way through San Antonio, Texas, he became hungry, stole some food, and then waited for police to arrive. He was arrested and sent to jail. 
Then, in walked Joseph's court-appointed attorney, Dan Carabin. He looked at his client and saw a broken 17-year-old boy in need of some help and had no business being sent to prison. But the reality was that Cannon would serve jail time if he could not find a stable living environment to serve out his probation. Dan called up his sister, Ann Walsh, also an attorney, and told her about the troubled teenager. He was able to persuade his sister, who had just recently divorced, and a mother of eight, to take in Joseph and allow him to serve out his five-year probation while living with her. This arrangement came about in September 1977, but just a week later, on September 30th, Joseph, who had been drinking and taking drugs, stumbled upon some guns in one of the bedrooms. Upon this discovery, Joseph heard the door open and saw that Anne had stopped by the home for lunch. She opened the door, walked inside, and Joseph, in his own words, just went crazy. He came out of the bedroom and shot Anne six times with a twenty two caliber pistol and then attempted to sexually assault her body. Rifled through her purse, picked up some money, traveler's checks, and coins, and then left with the keys to one of the Walsh children's cars and took off. Yet as Joseph sped out of the driveway, he almost hit a constable's car and a chase ensued. But this stopped shortly after when Joseph wrecked the car and was arrested. He told police, I had no grudge or any reason to kill Anne. In fact, she went out of her way to be nice to me. I'm on probation and my attorney arranged for me to stay with his sister, Ann Walsh. He was charged with capital murder and his bail was set at $150,000. Cannon pled innocent by reason of insanity at his trial in February 1979. During the course of his trial, information of his past was presented to the jury such as him being hit by a car at four years old, resulting in severe head injuries, being left hyperactive, and with a speech impediment. By the age of seven, he was subjected to constant sexual abuse from his stepfather and grandfather, as well as beatings. At age 10, he was hospitalized for sipping gasoline to get high, and while in their care, he was diagnosed as suffering from organic brain damage, severe depression, schizophrenia, and borderline mental retardation. At age 15, he was diagnosed as psychotic and attempted suicide by drinking insecticide. The defense presented psychological experts who testified to Cannon's low intelligence and mental instability and had diagnosed him as antisocial with serious mental disorders. Cannon's mother also testified to the troubled, violent childhood he endured. The court-appointed defense attorney, William G. Brown, told the jury, There's no question that Joseph Cannon murdered Ann Walsh, but there was no evidence that the killing occurred during a robbery. That kid doesn't have enough sense to come in out of the rain. For the state, Assistant District Attorney Larry Souza made the final argument stating, What he is, is a predator. He roams about cities preying on the weak. He's a vulture who has been feeding off the carcasses of crime since he was 10 years old. This was referring to the age at which Cannon was first accused of a crime by juvenile authorities in Houston. Continuing, he said, He's the type of guy that makes you want to lock your doors, and not pick up hitchhikers. The jury deliberated for an hour and 12 minutes before they returned a verdict of guilty and sentenced Joseph Cannon to death. Cannon, however, was granted a new trial in 1982, in which Cannon received new appointed attorneys who decided not to rely on an insanity theory. Instead, they tried to suppress Cannon's blood-chilling confession and after the court admitted it into evidence, they tried to convince the jury that it should not credit the confession because of inconsistencies with the indictment and with other evidence before them. 
but this strategy also failed, and the second jury found him guilty. At the punishment stage, the defense decided not to use the parade of psychiatric experts that resulted in a death sentence in the first trial. Instead, they presented no mitigating evidence in the hope that the jury would view him as a confused, disadvantaged teenager who had a momentary loss of self-control and who no longer posed a threat to society. They had also successfully managed to exclude testimony from the state psychiatric expert. But this didn't help, and again, Joseph Cannon was sentenced to death. The death penalty was reinstated in 1976, and 10 years later, in 1986, 36 states allowed capital punishment. 27 set specific minimum ages at the time the crime was committed. Minimum age 10, one state, Indiana. Minimum age 12, one state, Montana. Minimum age 14, eight states. Minimum age 15, two states. Minimum age 16, one state, Nevada. Minimum age 17, three states, including Texas. Minimum age 18, 10 states. And nine states had no minimum age set. Victor Stribe, a professor of law at Cleveland State University, an authority on death penalty for juveniles, stated, All of these psychological surveys done over the last 50 years shows that there is no additional deterrent effect from the death penalty over life in prison. But even if there were, when you look at the kind of murders teenagers commit, you see they are invariably impulse killers. They also don't have any realistic perception of death. Grandparents die, not kids. If anything, kids are attracted to death-defying behavior. They drive recklessly. They ingest dangerous drugs. They attempt suicide, not really believing they are going to die, but because it sounds exciting. So threatening them with death hardly deters them. However, if you threaten a teenager with being grounded for life, take away his car and his girlfriend, and send him to a dirty hole for life, he knows what that means. Dr. Dorothy Lewis, a professor of psychiatry at New York University School of Medicine, studied both adult and juvenile violent offenders. She stated, Most violent youngsters have suffered a head or nervous system injury or have shown a history of severe psychiatric illness, neither of which necessarily causes violence. But when these conditions are coupled with growing up in a family in which the youth is horribly abused or witnesses extreme violence, it seems to create a very violent individual. I'm not even sure that his being the victim as important as seeing extraordinary family violence. The most common argument made against the execution of juveniles is unlike 40-year-old career criminals, the young still offer the chance of rehabilitation. Professor Lewis continued, Children are more malleable. They are not yet set in their ways. A psychiatrist were not even allowed to make the diagnosis of antisocial personality prior to age 18. The reason is that children are still changing. In my experience, a lot of kids who have already committed violent acts, even murder, are eminently treatable. I know one who received treatment in a private setting. He had committed murder as a juvenile. He is now an adult. He has a job, a family, and is doing well. He's never gotten into trouble again. But kids who receive such treatment are very rare. And as far as I know, there aren't any programs for the kids in prison. By the next year, in 1987, the courts held that the proper cutoff should be the age of 16. 
but states gradually applied more stringent standards to avoid conflict with other areas of the law where children were treated differently. Upon Cannon entering death row, he was unable to read or write. He had the time to learn and then focused on studying history, science, and philosophy. He even wrote an article that was published in a German magazine. He was given the nickname Electrode by the other inmates because of his skill at repairing electrical devices such as fans and radios for inmates. In an interview in 1987, as being one of the five men on Texas death row for crimes they committed when they were 17, Joseph Cannon answered the question about banning death penalty for juveniles by stating, It seems to me that in this society, those under 18 are officially deemed unfit to make their own decisions. They aren't allowed to vote, and I don't hear anyone calling for a lowering of the drinking age. Therefore, it would follow that they are not responsible for their actions, generally speaking. I don't mean people should be allowed to do anything with impunity, but killing them for their mistakes is going a bit far. No youngster that age should be put on death row. The point is, I was a fool when I was a kid, but I'm not a kid anymore. You don't really learn anything by executing someone, but there is a benefit in keeping us here. In May 1991, Cannon had a trial hearing to determine the date for his execution. At this hearing, medical psychiatric director John Sparks testified. Because Cannon had been treated with the antipsychotic drug Melaril for the past nine years, he was mentally competent to understand he might be executed. Cannon would experience insomnia and severe depression if he stopped taking his daily dosage of the drug. He would then begin to have difficulty with reality, testing, and eventually might begin to hallucinate and hear voices. As I believe his case file indicates, he has in the past. His execution date was set for August 18, 1991. After the hearing, his attorney, Vincent Denny Callahan, was quoted as saying, Maybe... His strategy should be to stop taking Melaro, and he will deteriorate and become a raging beast and not even understand who he is and be back in court again under the issue he is insane. Ed Shognessy, chief of the appeals section of the Bear County District Attorney's Office, questioned the ethics of an attorney giving a client such advice. But upon hearing this, Callahan responded, I have to be ethical, but I appear to be left with the choice of allowing him to take Melaril and be executed or stop taking the drug and save his life. However, Cannon was granted a stay and another execution date was set. In an interview the week before his execution, Cannon said, It's going to go through. I've thought about it for about a year. I sort of expect the worst and hope for the best. In the weeks leading up to his execution, Cannon had acknowledged his guilt in many interviews, but said he believes he had changed during his long stay in prison, further explaining, I don't know if something changed in my brain or the fact I've grown up and can appreciate the value of my wrongs. I just want people to know that I'm sorry. His attorneys argued before the U.S. Supreme Court he should be spared because international law sets 18 as the minimum age for executions. The High Court Wednesday morning rejected the appeal without dissent. There was also an international outcry over Cannon's age when he committed the crime, such as Pope John Paul II, who had sent a letter to Texas Governor George W. Bush urging that the execution be halted. South Africa Archbishop Desmond Tutu also called for the governor to spare his life, as did members of the parliament in Italy, where opposition to the death penalty is very strong. But Bush refused, and Cannon's execution would proceed on April 22, 1998. The day of Joseph Cannon's execution arrived, 
and no one would be able to save him. He walked to the table, laid down, and turned to his witnesses. He made his final statement and goodbyes, and he was injected. But the execution was delayed when the vein in his arm collapsed, requiring the needle to be removed and then restarted. When the vein collapsed, the prison officials then shut a drape that blocked him from the witnesses who were then led outside, where they waited for about 15 minutes while another injection was prepared. And they were told, his blood vein blew. He's doing fine. They're just going to restart it. During a second round of final statements, the witnesses cried and prayed together, among whom were five of Anne Walsh's sons. This was Cannon's final statement. I'm sorry for what I did to your mom. I'm sorry for all of you. I love you all. I thank you all for being kind to me when I was small. Cannon's mother, who did not witness the execution of her son, but was waiting outside, fainted as she saw the witnesses come outside and had to be taken to a Huntsville hospital. Stephanie Walsh, Ann Walsh's daughter, said after the execution, It's been very traumatic. The entire process has taken longer than normal. I'm just glad it's over. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like and subscribe button below. If you want to inquire about a commission, you can email Russell at russellstuart.art at gmail.com. You can watch Russell live stream his art on Twitch. And if you want to hear more true crime stories, you can subscribe to my podcast, Crimes of a Decade, a Texas true crime podcast. Now that we are done, make sure to wash the brush. Just beat the devil out of it.